Hello everybody, welcome to the first lecture on this YouTube channel. Today I will be giving a brief introduction to roses. I hope this will be a good starting off point to understand the other videos on this YouTube channel and any future videos I'll make, including other lectures. I also hope that this will be a good foundation of knowledge for anybody who wants to pursue a journey into this wonderful genus of plants in the future. Maybe you want to become a breeder or something like that. The main question I am hoping to scratch the surface of in this video is what are roses? Maybe we can say who are roses? What is their identity? Well, roses are plants in the genus Rosa. Some closely related genera are the Rubus, which is brambles or raspberries, and Fregaria, which is strawberries. Plants in the genus Rosa are defined by any organism that is descended from the last common ancestor of all roses, which lived uh, over 50 million years ago. Rose fossils are pretty common. On the right here is Rosa fortuita. This is a pretty common wild, uh, wild common rose. And another common rose fossil is, um, oh, is Rosa hillae. Rosa germarensis is the oldest rose fossil that we found, as far as I know, dated to around 50 million years ago. And that was found in the Calus volcanic formation in Idaho. Because this genus has been evolving for so long, humans have divided it into four subgenera. Within these four subgenera, there is a total of 100 to 300 different species. Why so many different species? Why such a big range? Because there is disagreement between lumpers and splitters on the number of species because they don't, they, there isn't consensus whether a particular species is truly its own species or it is a subspecies of a larger, you know, more varied species. A basic rose anatomy. Well, roses are flowering plants, angiosperms, and their flower is their most prized characteristic for humans. Their flower sits on top of a stem. The stem has a wide variety of structures, especially leaf structures on it. Uh, and an interesting structure that it has are its prickles which are sometimes mistakenly called thorns. Roses don't have thorns. Thorns are a different structure found in even uh, closely related genera, but roses don't have thorns. On the stems, there are leaves, uh, different varieties of leaves. They may look different from each other. The plant is held onto the ground via its roots. Its roots are connected to the stems by a transition region. The transition region, which is about right over here, is important for the health and stability of the plant. There is an optional uh, anatomical feature on roses, only on grafted roses. That is called the bud union. Well, what are grafted roses, first of all? Grafted roses are when you take your desired variety of rose and you fuse it onto another plant so that, particularly one with stronger roots, so that the strong root characteristics of uh, that plant will transfer onto your desired variety almost like a parasitic relationship where the nutrients from the soil, uh, from the roots, will go only into the growth of your fused or grafted variety. When you do this, 
their a new anatomical uh, feature will come called a bud union or a graft union. And typically, grafting is done at the base of the plant, so you'll see it here. That's where all the grafted growth will come from. That's called scion growth. The desired variety is called the scion variety. Because grafted roses, you're basically depending on the scion variety to uh, give, it, give the plant the uh, ornamental characteristics that you desire. The bud union is an important site for the health of your rose. Roses are flowering plants, as we said. Flowering plant, flowers are themselves sexually, sexual reproduction organs. When the rose is finished having sex, a fruit will start to form. This, this structure you see on the top right here is called a rose hip. Rose hips are for human purposes, for animal purposes, you know, for eating purposes, the fruit. But actually, they're the accessory fruit. The real fruit is inside the rose hips, what you may first identify as the seeds, the hard things that you see inside these are actually the real fruit. There are a type of fruit called achenes. They have a very hard exterior, the, the flesh, you might want to call it, where, and the real seed is inside. The rose flower, what humans care about the most. In the wild, the wild type rose has five petals, although domesticated roses may also have five petals, but the wild ones, for the most part, have five petals, except for one species that have four, and there may be occasional mutations that increase the number of petals. But these five petals come from the base of the plant, sorry, base of the flower, and rose flowers are hermaphrodites, meaning they have both the male and female reproductive organs on the same flower, monoecious. The male reproductive organs are these structures extending from the base of the flower, these long ones. They're called stamens. They consist of a long filament which holds, which extend it away from the base of the flower, and they hold on top of them the anther. Anthers are, upon opening of the flower, closed. But as they're exposed to the outside elements, particularly sunlight, they will open and release the pollen grains. And the pollen grains, by some physical or mechanical uh, mode, by some mechanical force, they will have to reach the female reproductive organ. This may be done by the wind, by movement of the plant, uh, physical movement of the stamens near the uh, female reproductive organ, or they may be done by a pollinator. As you can guess, self-fertilization is pretty common in roses, but hybridization happens all the time. Hybridization can happen between very distantly related roses, different species, different varieties, different species, even the most distantly related rose can hybridize with our domesticated roses. Now, the pollen will have to find its way to the female reproductive organ, the stigma. The stigma at the base, at the middle of the flower is, secretes a sticky substance. Now in real life, it is not this long. It's very close to the middle of the flower. But it secretes a sticky substance that the pollen will stick onto. And what will happen is this sticky substance also provides a medium for the pollen grains to germinate. The pollen grains will germinate into a pollen tube that will extend from the stigma down into the ovary, the female gamete. And once it has done so, the real fertilization will happen, the fertilization of the haploid uh, 
cells. Once the flower is fertilized, the flower petal will fall off and this structure here will start swelling and ripening into a rose hip. The real fruit are inside these and they're developing and ripening as well. On top of where the rose hip will be, there are specialized leaf structures called sepals. They're just one of a different type, one of the uh, variety of types of leaf structures that you will find on roses. Now the flower sits on top of the stem. The flower petals themselves are specialized leaves. Below the flower, we said, were the sepals. But the flower structure sits on top of the stem. The stem on it has the leaves and prickles, as we said. There are different types of leaves on the stem. The generic leaf, you know, the most common uh, leaf form that you'll find on roses is something like this. Roses have compound leaves, meaning their leaves are segmented into fairly independent segments called leaflets. How are they independent? Well, if one of them is damaged by herbivory or by uh, disease, the other ones can continue to function. And they're connected via a petiole. The petiole will uh, transport water and nutrients to and from the leaves. At the base of the leaf, there is a stipule, which is another type of kind of leafy structure where that will, the different varieties or species of roses have different looking stipules. And if you have a keen eye, you can use those to determine what species they are. At the base of the leaf, even farther than the stipule, on the stem, just above the stipule, is a structure called a node or a bud. They will be on top of every leaf on a stem. And this is where there will be a high concentration of meristematic tissue, relatively undifferentiated cells. And this is where new stem growths will come out of. New, each stem Basically, it's each stem growth or shoot, its goal, especially in repeat blooming roses, not all roses are repeat blooming, especially wild roses. Repeat blooming is a characteristic that we derive from some wild roses into our domesticated roses. But in the wild, each stem, especially in its first wave of growth, will have a flower at the top of it. And almost all domesticated roses, they'll have a flower at the end of each stem growth. The stem will start off as softwood, and as the flowering happens, it will harden into semi-hardwood, and when the flowering is finished, it will become hardwood. The stem has, transports nutrients throughout the plant, to and from the flower. The, uh, if there is a rose hip starting to form, that requires a lot of nutrients, right, to ripen and develop into a offspring. But so the nutrient and water transport capabilities of the stem is very important, but the stem has a structural purpose as well. Once it, the stem becomes harder, the, uh, more new growths are depending on the structure of that stem that has been created. Well, when a stem is forming, why don't all the nodes create new growths at once? That is because the flowering process secretes hormones that inhibit the outgrowths of the buds or the nodes. The nodes will only start growing, well, uh, you know, the, the hormones only work within a certain distance from the flower, but 
Within that distance, the, those buds will only start growing once the flower has been spent and the plant has determined that it's right, it's the right time, you know, due to nutritional availability to create new stem growths. There may be more if there is a high abundance of water and nutrients, but for the most part, these outgrowths are pretty slow. They'll only happen once the flower has been spent and especially if it has not been pollinated. On the stem, there are other types of leaves. One is called bracts. Bracts are like deformed leaves. They aren't fully formed. They usually come about when there is very fast explosive growth, typically when there is a high amount of water or nutrients available, you know, like a rare condition for that plant. It'll send out explosive long growth. Maybe like, okay, the growth is more important than fully forming the leaf. We'll create these bracts. Unfully, not fully developed leaves. They don't, bracts aren't, aren't very common. When, uh, within a certain distance from where the stem decides to make a flower, the leaves will look different. They will have a different number of leaflets, usually less. I mean, always, almost always, you know, they'll typically have the same amount or less, more commonly less near the uh, flower. It's because the flower, this is the, the hormonal, this is due to the hormonal characteristics of the tissue surrounding that area. Not only that, the leaflets will look different sometimes, you know, not always. Uh, especially in domesticated roses, you'll find that the leaflets look different near the flower. And the prickles are also uh, located throughout the stem. They can also be on the flower bud, on the leaves, and on the uh, rose hip. Prickles are themselves specialized trichomes, highly developed trichomes. Now, not all roses have uh, prickles. That is due to mutations or silencing in any of the uh, factors which lead to the formation of the trichomes and the development of the trichomes. But for the most part, uh, roses, almost, uh, almost all roses do have prickles. Rose variation. Well, roses are extremely varied organisms. Well, sorry, well, the genus is extremely varied. Because of this, humans have uh, cultivated this vari these variations and have exacerbated the amount of variation within the genus artificially through our selection and breeding. Sites of variation are petal count and petal color. On the left here is Rosa rubiginosa. I took this picture myself. This is a wild rose. And on the right is Charles Darwin, which I consider to be a masterpiece of rose breeding. Rosa rubiginosa has five petals. It's a wild rose. But Charles Darwin here has over a hundred petals. Humans have selected for the increase in petal count that sometimes appears in the wild. The number of petals is related to the number of stamens, the male reproductive organs, because the cell differentiation pathways that will lead to the petals and the male reproductive organs, the stamens, happened fairly late. The, de the determination to become one type of tissue versus the other happens fairly late in the 
cell differentiation pathway. The result of that is that there is a give or take relationship between the number of petals and the number of stamens. The more petals there are, the less stamens there are. And you may begin to start thinking about the reproductive consequences of having more petals on a flower and why natural selection has deemed five petals to be the sweet spot for the vast majority of roses. You can also start to think about the reproductive consequences that uh, are inflicted onto our domesticated roses, the ones that have so many petals. Charles Darwin, because it has so many petals, it has very little, if any, stamens. I've never seen it in real life. I've only seen it in pictures. Uh, David Austin, the breeders don't ship to Canada, where I'm from, unfortunately. And if you want to buy it, they're super expensive. But other super high petal roses, I've seen them. Sometimes they don't have any um, stamens. That has consequences on the long-term breeding of those lineages and uh, that may be beneficial to uh, breeder companies that don't want you to propagate their roses. I'm not saying they're all so mean but whatever. Petal color has considerable variation. Humans of course love our red roses but most roses are pink or white. Uh, they can also be purple and the, some domesticated roses are almost bluish although a true blue rose has never been created yet. And yellow is a pretty common domesticated rose color you see but it's also present in some wild roses. Plant size Rosa rubiginosa here has very small flowers, while Charles Darwin has very large flowers. Flowers are not the only plant size variation within roses. The height of the plant can be different. There can be very uh, short mini roses. There can be very tall, prolific, monster roses, the climbing roses. I'll go up to 20 feet or more. The leaf size can be different. The rose hip size can be different. The flower bud size can be different. The um, uh, stem size, the, the leaf lit size, the root size, you know, and even the thickness of the main stem, the cane, can be varied. Although that one, of course, increases in size as the plant ages. The leaflet shape and the leaflet number. Now, because there are so many species of roses, uh, it'll be kind of difficult to identify one species versus the other, but for the most part, if there's any variation in a wild rose in the leaflet shape, it's almost always an, uh, an indicator that you're dealing with different species. Domesticated roses have a lot more variation in their leaflet shape because they are hybrids of many species. The leaflet number, usually the smaller the leaflets, the more leaflets there will have to be per leaf. Uh, very small leaflets, for example, in a species like Rosa xanthina, there may be selection pressures which have led there to be more leaflets per leaf, like nine leaflets per leaf. Purple frequency, uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, they are specialized trichomes and some roses don't have any thorns, sorry, prickles, <laughs> even I mix it up sometimes. The prickles, are specialized trichomes. And the ones that don't have prickles usually have a mutation in the pathway which leads to the initiation or development of the prickles. But 
why are prickles a feature on roses? It's because they provide defense against herbivory. Herbivores will not want to eat a rose that has so many prickles because they'll, be, they'll put it in their mouth and then they'll get poked, you know? Uh, that may cause infection and stuff. The plant, animals can even die. Humans, we have a lot of vaccines. We have vaccines that protect us against the um, diseases that rose prickle damage can give us. But yeah, that is a protection against herbivory. The more prickle, the higher the prickle frequency, the more protection there is against herbivores. Some species like Rosa rugosa have, uh, some species like Rosa rugosa have extremely high frequency of prickles. Th that is, you know, due to their specific life strategies that they've implemented through their evolution, through their lineage. But why does, would it want to protect its tissue against herbivory? Well, we talked about it a bit earlier too. Stems, which the, mo the vast majority of prickles are on stems, have not only structural significance, but also um, nutrient transportation significance. As a rose stem matures, its prickles become larger and harder. And once the prickle has finished uh, developing, it'll become woody like the stem. New growth tissue is less important to the rose than old tissue. Her primarily because there are less other tissues depending on the new stem that is emerging versus an older stem which has maybe 10 different growths coming out of it, 10 different rose hips ripening on that stem. That's why the larger, harder stems are more important for the plant to maintain, uh, you know, to maintain its life. That's why prickles are more developed and harder on older tissue. Eventually, when the tissue gets old enough, it'll become very woody. Instead of being the hardwood that you see when in the first year growth, first year growth will end in a hardwood state. It's called hardwood because you can't bend it easily, but it'll still be green. After the growth is two years, even more years old, it'll become truly woody, brown. And it'll have lots, it'll have much more responsibility in nutrient transfer and structural purpose. Once it's in this multiple year age, the prickles will, can fall off, but it's less important in this stage because animals are less likely to eat it. There will, there's less digestible tissue in those really hard stems versus the hardwood that is still green but has hard prickles on it. Why might a rose decide it wants less prickles than Rosa rugosa, like we talked about? This is, they may be using their prickles for another purpose. Climbing roses, instead of using their prickles for defense, although they may still use it for defense, it would be a secondary benefit to defense, Instead, they'll use their prickles for structural purpose. Structural purposes. Climbing roses, uh, because they still have the same general uh, uh, diameter of their stems, they're lanky, they can fall off, they may not be able to support their, support their own weight. These prickles can almost be like hooks to attach onto different plants, attach onto different uh, they can attach onto human structures or rocks to support their own structure, the enormous heights that they want to have. But these are just some uh, sites of variation that we talked about, but almost all uh, 
characteristics of roses can have variation, even ones that aren't visible. For example, in one lineage of roses, a, the structure of a particular protein may be different than another lineage of roses due to mutations that have accumulated in that locus. But there can also be mutations that don't result in a difference in protein structure, silent mutations. These mutations, although the protein isn't different, on a molecular level, there is variation between this lineage versus that lineage. Another type of not visible rose variation that is very common is variation in ploidy. Ploidy refers to the number of copies of a particular, of the entire genome of the rose. Roses have a base number of chromosomes of seven. The ploidy number will determine how many copies of the seven chromosomes that there are. On the right here is a karyotype. A karyotype is a picture of the chromosomes at a specific time in mitosis where the chromosomes will be condensed for us to be able to visualize. This is a karyotype of Rosa wicherana. Rosa wicherana is diploid or 2N. Its ploidy number is two. It has two copies of each of the seven chromosomes. The general theory, and I've heard this in some papers that I've read, is that here is the wrong word. The general understanding is that the lower the ploidy of a lineage, the more specialized it is. And vice versa, the higher the ploidy of a lineage, the more generalized it is. The more generalized a rose, the more, the wider the geographic and environmental range that it can tolerate. And this has implications for conservation of species. If it's a low ploidy, it may be uh, hard to conserve that species. It may be endangered. If it has a high ploidy, it can be invasive, has higher invasive capabilities. Roses, because they've been evolving for so long and they have so many species, humans have characterize them, categorize them into four subgenera. These four subgenera are Polythemia, Platyrrhodon, Hesperodos, and the type subgenus Rosa. Rosa is the most significant genetic contributor to our domesticated roses. The first subgenus I'd like to talk about, and this is the most controversial one, and in my opinion, the most interesting one, is Polythemia. This one is diploid, it is 2M. This is the only subgenus within Rosa that does not have compound leaves. It has simple leaves instead. Instead of being segmented into leaflets, its leaves are a single mass. It also, because the compound leaf is not there, it does not have stipules. There may be two species in this subgenus, Rosa persica and Rosa berberifolia. The difference between these is that Rosa persica has wide serrated leaves where Rosa berberifolia has long, smoother leaves. And Rosa berberifolia also has longer, narrower flower petals. These roses live in the desert. Rosa persica is not called persica for nothing. It is from Iran, Persia. It lives in the deserts in the Middle East. Because of this, it has some adaptations to uh, you know, increase its survivability, its fitness. One of these is that instead of growing upwards like uh, most other roses, instead it'll, it more creeps. 
uh, another thing it has is that its leaves are thicker, more succulent to hold more water. That may be important in the dry, hot environment that it lives in. Now the question is, are the compounds, sorry, are the simple leaves that you find in this subgenus a derived trait or are they an ancestral trait? Meaning, it, did the ancestor of all roses have compound leaves like polythemia or did it have compound leaves like all the other roses? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know if uh, scientists have discovered that, but I'm very interested to understand that. I think it's more likely that the simple leaves are a uh, derived, uh, sorry, are, yeah, are a derived trait. They are derived from the compound leaves of the ancestor. Why I think this is that because they live in the desert, a compound leaf may be more costly. Don't quote me on that because I don't know the answer, but that's just my hypothesis. That, the difference in the uh, leaf structure of this subgenus, the simple leaves versus the compound leaves of all other roses, were the reason why there was the second controversy. The first controversy was whether or not these two are the same species or not. Whether the Rosa Berber folia is a variant of Rosa persica. That was the first controversy and that was due to the difference in the leaf morphology. But the second controversy, and this one has been settled, but some people don't want to let this go, is that it was once believed that Halthemia was its own sub, it was its own genus. The genus was called Halthemia. And instead of Rosa persica, this one was called Halthemia persica. And this one was called uh, Halthemia berberifolia. Or if the other controversy is true, this one would have been Halthemia berberifolia, sorry, Halthemia persica berberifolia, subgenus, subspecies berberifolia. Why did they, some people believe that Halthemia belonged to its own genus? Well, because of the compound leaves, sorry, because of the simple leaves. If the simple leaves are a derived trait, then it is more reason, more uh, to categorize this subgenus as a true subgenus. If it was an ancestral trait and the compound leaves evolved later in the lineage that results in the other three subgenera of roses, then that is more reason to say that Halthemia is its own genus. I think it's more likely that the compound leaves are a derived Sorry, the simple leaves are a derived trait rather than an ancestral trait. And I do believe Halthemia is a subgenus within uh, Rosa as it is currently categorized by taxonomists. But the main reason why Halthemia is its own, is a subgenus rather than its own genus is because Halthemia can hybridize with the rest of our domesticated roses and this other species of roses. Just different leaf morphology is not entirely enough to say that this is its own subgenus, although it, it could be a reason. Taxonomy is a social construct. But the fact that it can hybridize with our other roses was enough for scientists to say that uh, Halthemia is a subgenus rather than its own genus. Halthemia hybrids are a very interesting rabbit hole to go down. Because they're di most distantly related, 
to our domesticated roses, there was difficulty in hybridizing them, but there was difficulty hybridizing them, but the breeders made it work. This is Bullseye, a Holthemia hybrid by Peter James, uh, released in 2011. If you look at the flower, they, there's, more there's more flower petals than the wild type Holthemia. But they decided to keep the color variation. The outer petals are lighter than the inside of the petals. That's the trait that they decided to keep. Although they wanted, the breeder decided they wanted different colors. And all female hybrids can come in a wide variety of different colors, but they are characterized by this uh, color variation. You know, they had to work a lot to create a stable line of Holthemia hybrids because, you know, there was the genetic variation between Holthemia's lineage and our domesticated roses. And ultimately, if you look at the leaves, they decided they did not want to keep the simple leaves of the wild Holthemia. They just transferred the flowering form onto our domesticated roses. That was a choice by the breeder. That may be due to creating this, that may be have practical reasons they want to, to create a stable line. You have to create it, have the compound leaves. I don't know, but these are choices that the breeder had to make. The next subgenus is Hesperodos. This one is also diploid. And this one has two species, Rosa minutifolia and Rosa stellata. This one also has a controversy whether these ones are the same species or not. I've never seen these in real life. They don't grow where I'm from. This one is interesting because it has very serrated small leaflets. Now, I can't speak on this too much because I've never seen it before and I haven't studied it very well, but the debate is between whether these are different species or they are subspecies of a larger species. Plat Platyrodon, this one is the last one that is exclusively diploid. This one only has one species, Rosa Roxburghi. This one is of agricultural significance because its rose pips have medical significance and some say it also tastes good. So these are farmed and the rose hips are cultivated. There is difficulty in cultivating this one because its rose hips are covered in prickles that affects the picking cultivation process and processing process. So that's why breeders want to create Rosa Roxburghi that does not have prickles. You know, by mutating the, by mutating the trichome initiation and development pathways. The subgenus Rosa. This one is the most varied subgenus. 2N, 4N, 5N, 6N, 8N. It's even theorized that there was once 10N organism that is now extinct. I've never seen it, can't confirm. This one if you if you were counting on the other three subgenera, you counted a total of five, perhaps even three, if the uh, lumpers are correct. This one has the vast majority of species, hundred or more. Because of this, humans have categorized them. Not only are there so many species, this one has the most variation. You know. This one has the most branches that are unique. Because of this, humans have categorized them into 11 sections. Now there's debate between taxonomists if one particular lineage, one particular uh, section has this many species, whether this species is included in this section versus another. You know, the debate will probably go on forever. But, yeah, they contain the vast majority of species, the vast majority of variation, and not only that, they are also the most common. 
nine times out of 10, if you see a rose, it's likely to be descended from uh, you know, the subgenus rosa. Our domesticated roses, although they are, um, they, on some lineages, they have hybridized other subgenera into this. We talk about the Holthemia hybrids. For the most part, our domesticated roses are exclusively, almost exclusively derived from the subgenus rosa. And for the purposes of this lecture, let's consider our domesticated roses to be part of the subgenus rosa. Why did humans decide they want to domesticate the subgenus rosa? Well, we talked about it. It is the most common, is the most common subgenus. If you find a rose, it is much more likely than not to be part of the subgenus rosa. So just because of the, uh, what was available around may have been a reason that humans decided to cultivate these ones rather than the other subgenera. On the left here is Rosa Glauca. Oh, well, we talked about, I mentioned earlier that almost all roses can hybridize with each other unless there's like some genetic incompatibility. But even the most distantly related rose, Holthemia, can hybridize with our domesticated roses. Breeders can utilize this vast amount of variation in their domestication. On the left here is Rosa Glauca. I took both of these pictures myself. Rosa Glauca has bluish leaves, like a very blue-green type of leaf that has ornamental, you know, significance. It's beautiful in my opinion. Its flowers are not that interesting to me. But let's say you had this one, and you also had this uh, species, Rosa hugonis, or it could be Rosa xanthina, if you were a lumper or a splitter. Rosa hugonis has naturally occurring yellow flowers. Let's say you wanted this foliage with this flower. You can hybridize these two and based on the offspring, you can select the ones that have this foliage with this flower. You might need to do the hybridization more than once. But this is how breeders can utilize the, genet the vast amount of genetic variation within roses to mix and match different traits. Rosa xanthina, or Rosa uh, hugonis here, has very small leaflets, and because of that has many more leaflets than uh, typical roses. Rosa glauca may have five or seven leaflets per leaf, while Rosa hugonis has like nine. Just one point I'd like to add about the number of leaflets. Our domesticated roses usually have much larger leaflets than the wild counterparts. That's a trait we've selected for. That may be due to its super large uh, flowers need more energy. I don't know, but that is a correlation. Our domesticated roses on average have larger leaves than the wild roses. Because of that, not, not exclusively because of that, but correlated to that is that domesticated roses usually have less leaflets than wild roses. They may have five if they have very large uh, leaflets. That's not the rule, it's just the trend. Humans have been cultivating roses for thousands of years. It's not documented when we started cultivating roses, but some reasons humans may have decided to start cultivating roses could be for their natural fencing capability. Roses are big, prickly plants. If you plant several side by side, 
you know, the wild ones, they don't have much issue germinating. All you have to do is just put them in the ground, side by side. They'll grow upwards and outwards. They'll grow into each other and create a real barrier that can be formidable for uh, predators to keep animals out of your um, uh, property. The animals may want to eat your, uh, you know, uh, animals that you've domesticated or animal husbandry, or they may want to eat your crops. That has implications for, you know, your life. So humans may have been uh, using roses natural fencing also to keep your animals from leaving your property. The ornamental significance of roses, I think humans probably discovered this before agriculture had even been discovered yet. Humans before agriculture, they knew plants very well. They knew this plant was this, this plant was that. Instead of breeding a, spe a species into many forms that have different purposes, for example, Brassica oleracea uh, has been turned into broccoli, cauliflower, kale, uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, gailon. Instead of doing that, they were very in tune with all the plants that were around. And they definitely, in my opinion, recognized the ornamental significance of roses. Some have bigger flowers than others. And because of this, roses were probably on humans' radar long before agriculture was invented. And once agriculture was invented, the theory that you could take a seed and plant it and it'll create a new plant, they, they must have applied it to roses and valued its ornamental value, planting it in their property. It's obvious because eventually humans decide, uh, uh, decided to start uh, breeding the flower into different forms. The fragrance of roses were probably also understood by humans before agriculture. In my opinion, Roses have the best fragrance of any flower. It's part of the reason why I love them so much. Uh, their fragrance is captivating. Humans definitely smelled them before agriculture started. They may have thought it had medical significance, their fragrance. It may, it may have had perfumery significance, aphrodisiac. For these reasons, they may have cultivated roses before they started planting roses. They may have cultivated the petals, rubbed them on themselves, put them in their settlements. And this may have been the reason they started agriculturally cultivating roses. Rose essential oil, which you can distill from rose petals, likely was very important in perfumery uh, in ancient cultures, and to this day continues to be one of the most expensive essential oils out there. A byproduct of rose essential oil production is rose water. Rose water smells just like, basically just like rose essential oil, although less strong, and, <coughs> excuse me, although less strong, uh, you, they, people use it in food, especially in desserts. How are roses cultivated or propagated? First, there's sexual propagation. Sexual propagation is when you take a seed of a rose and you germinate it. Sexual offspring from the mother plant and father plant. The issue with this, the reason why humans don't do this very commonly is because roses don't grow true from seed. It is very unlikely that the seed you have germinated is going to look similar morphologically to the mother plant or father plant, especially in domesticated roses because there's so much genetic variation in domesticated roses that we utilize from different species. Now, a wild rose 
will have less incentive to have the variation between mother and offspring because there is a certain form that each wild rose has evolved to uh, maintain its life survival strategies. But nonetheless, there is still variation between those. And although the main, uh, a wild rose, its offspring can look very similar to the uh, mother, we talked about on a molecular level, they are different because meiosis results in a shuffling of the genes. Now, just think about if there was a hybridization between two species, the shuffling of these genes can create new combinations. It doesn't even have to be hybridization between two species. It can be a hybridization between two individuals of the same species. The shuffling, they are genetically um, uh, uh, different, one, organ, one individual versus the other. When they shuffle the genes, the offspring will have a unique combination of the genes of the mother plant and the father plant. That's why there is a lot of variation between offspring and uh, the parents. Roses can also self-fertilize, and even when there is self-fertilization, there is difference between the mother plant and the offspring. Talk about wild roses, they may want to keep their morphological um, form, but they want to keep their morphology because it is essential to their survival. But even in self-fertilization, there's different gene combinations. They may not be entirely visible, but there is variation between the parent and the offspring. We talked about a non-visible variation. If there is a higher ploidy in a rose, the more variation there will be if there is between mother, parent, and offspring, if there is self-fertilization. There is more copies of each gene that can be paired with each other in meiosis and the eventual fertilization process. Our domesticated roses which have higher ploidy and more variation between their the genes on each chromosome, each homologous chromosome. That's one of the reasons why uh, the variation between a parent and an offspring plant is so huge in domesticated roses. Another reason why domesticated roses have so much variation between offspring and parent is because domesticated roses are a complex hybrid of many species. The most, the most, the largest genetic contributors to domesticated roses are Rosa canina and Rosa gallica. Other species have been brought in over the years, but uh, the biggest contrib genetic contributors are those two species. Now think about it like this. Maybe you want to grow Rosa canina. canina. It's a wild species. You grow the seed it needs to maintain a certain morphology, although Rosa canina, canina is one of the most varied uh, roses. By hybridizing, you can create even more variation. And it wasn't, maybe it wasn't even humans that deliberately created this hybridization. It may be a naturally occurring hybrid that humans just decided to start cultivating because it looked different from other roses. Maybe it had more petals, maybe it had a new color. For whatever reason, the roses that we started cultivating are a hybrid of Rosa canina and Rosa gallica. The hybridization may have happened after each of those species were started to be cultivated, but hybridization is a way we introduce more variation and 
by doing so, each generation will have, will look even less similar to the parent from which it came from. And that's why sexual propagation is not done very often, especially for just general home garden purposes. Sexual propagation is mostly done by rose breeders who want to create new varieties of roses, which they will then asexually propagate to bring into market. One type of asexual propagation that we've already talked about was grafting. You will fuse a scion variety or a desired variety onto a strong rootstock. The issue with this form of propagation is that it's almost like a parasitic relationship. All the shoot growth is, all the stem growth and the leaf growth is coming from the scion variety while it is entirely utilizing the root capabilities of the rootstock variety. What's happening here is that the rootstock variety, even though it's contributing so much to this plant's health, it does not confer any fitness benefit to the rootstock variety. All the shoot growth is coming from the scion variety. If that plant decides to uh, flower fruit and then bear offspring, it does not give any fitness benefit to the rootstock variety because the, the rootstock variety did not contribute any genetic material to the, uh, to the offspring. Because of this, the rootstock variety doesn't want the graft, right? Humans will, we want the graft to grow, but not all gardeners are uh, so mindful to look at the plant because what will happen is the rootstock will send out its own growth, a type of growth called a sucker. And because the rootstock is much more powerful than the grafted variety, typically because uh, graft, uh, rootstocks are wild roses or a very strong rose variety called, um, you know, there's Dr. Huey, one is commonly used. Because the rootstock is so much more powerful than the graft, it'll send out its own growth and then it'll overpower the graft. The graft will die off and the person who is not mindful of their plan to cut off the uh, suckers will in a couple of years be left with a plant in their garden that they did not pay for. They did not want the rootstock variety. They wanted the scion variety. That's why um, uh, grafting is not the best form of propagation. It is the most commonly done form of propagation. It is the easiest to do. Um, we talked about suckers in the context of grafted roses, but old root plants also make their uh, make suckers, and suckers are a way to propagate roses as well. You can cut off the sucker, and if there are roots attached, you can pot that or plant that, and it'll create a asexual clone. Cuttings are probably the most famous or most like logical form of uh, rose propagation, the one that most it will come into uh, people's heads the most. You'll take a cutting of a stem, usually around the node, where there will be the most, um, where there will be the most uh, undifferentiated, relatively undifferentiated uh, cells. And you will pot that either in a soil or a soilless medium like sand and vermiculate. And you're hoping that the relatively undifferentiated cells around the node will develop into roots. And um, you will propagate a clone asexually, just like the stem cutting that you've just taken. There is a phenomenon called sports. I should have mentioned this in the rose variation slide, but sometimes one stem 
of a rose will morphologically be different than the rest of the plant. This may be due to gene silencing, gene activation, or good old mutation, but the result is that it is morphologically different than the rest of the plant. This is a form of intra-plant variation. Maybe it has more petals, maybe the flower is larger, maybe it's a different color, maybe the leaves look different. The pot, there's many possibilities. But you can conserve the morphological characteristics of that one stem, it's called a sport, by taking a clone of that stem, maybe by a cutting. Or by this next method that we're gonna discuss, this is a relatively new one, it's called micropropagation or tissue culture. This is when, this is another soilless uh, form of propagation where instead of putting it, instead of putting the cutting on a soil medium or a medium where you're, that doesn't have nutrients that the plant can absorb in a rootless state. You put the cutting, and you can do very small cuttings with this method. You can do very, like one centimeter ones, although they still have to be the node tissue. You can put it on a nutrient medium instead, that the plant can absorb the nutrients to not die. And then by giving the plant hormones, you can induce it to create roots. Instead of depending on the plant to do that itself, you can give it to create those, the plant, in cuttings, the plant will have to create those hormones itself. But in this method, you give the hormones to make roots or make leaves. And this can increase, this can decrease the time required to create a clone. And companies use this method all the time, especially when they just created an amazing new variety and they wanna get it out to market really fast. They're gonna do tissue culture on this plant, create 10,000, 100,000 clones and get it out to market very fast. This one has very high up front cost compared to cuttings, but the success rate is much higher than cuttings and happens much faster than uh, doing it by cuttings. This one, this method also requires a lot of knowledge. It's biotechnologies like these that make cultivation of roses easier. And it's other, uh, there's other biotechnologies like genetic engineering the various forms of genetic engineering that breeders can use to create new varieties and get them out to market faster. That's it for this lecture. I hope you learned something new. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please leave it in the comment section. I'll try to answer it. And if it's really interesting, I'll research it even more and hopefully I can make another lecture that addresses those questions. Thank you so much for watching.